Welcome to our CME and SDMS CME accredited ultrasound webinar, New Frontiers in CEUS for Echo Excellence, a step-by-step -step guide. <coughs> My name is Matt Wilson, representing the International Contrast Ultrasound Society, ICUS, in collaboration with Northwest Imaging Forms, the CME provider for this program. Northwest Imaging Forms is accredited as a CME provider by the ACCME. Northwest Imaging Forms designates this CME activity for 1.5 Category 1 credits towards the Physician's Recognition Award of the American Medical Association. Sonographer SDMS CME is also provided for those wishing to receive up to 1.5 hours of Category AE credit. The planner of this CME activity has nothing to disclose. Please find the Q&A button on your screen's lower menu bar to readily ask questions of the faculty as you are listening to their respective presentations. They will respond to questions in the discussionary period towards the end of our time allotted. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Stephen B. Feinstein, MD, FACC, FESC, Cardiology, Rust University Medical Center, Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Feinstein. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we can put up my first slide. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, I am <coughs> really excited to be with good friends and colleagues, Wilson, Sharon, and Jordy. <clears throat> uh, this webinar is a free uh, webinar. It's presented by ICAS in coordination with Northwest Imaging, our CME provider. Uh, thank you. So we thank all of those who helped plan today's program, the faculty, of course, those of you who have signed on, we're very pleased. As uh, Matt said, at the end, we will have a, a nice active Q&A session. And we thank all of you for just uh, joining us. And as we will go through in a series of brief slides, please, if you're not a member of ICAS, become a member. If you have not done the ICUS mobile app, please do so. So where are we? We're everywhere. We're in over 60 countries. We include everybody. All you have to have is an interest in contrast ultrasound. <clears throat> the uh, QR code is listed above. Uh, ICUS doesn't charge. The membership is free, so please go on our website or use a QR code. All these webinars are archived, stored, and they have uh, uh, CME credits. Uh, as I mentioned, the mobile app has a lot of interesting applications within it. And uh, please, once you're a member, you'll get uh, bi-weekly news monitors uh, translated um, uh, from English to Mandarin and uh, Portuguese. So what's the commitment of ICAS? Well, it's a tool that we should be using routinely in every ultrasound lab throughout the country. <clears throat> it is safe, uh, it's radiation free, beautiful resolution, improves patient outcomes, uh, uh, images all the vascular system, including all the organs, and including uh, tumors. And it's been shown to reduce downstream testing because the better quality images give you better diagnoses and less delay and redundant in testing. Uh, what's our commitment to education? extensive. That's our primary goal is to educate uh, and bring this forward. And this webinar is part of that. So ICAS is on Instagram. <coughs> and uh, thanks to Dirk, uh, Stephanie, Christine Merrill, uh, Tom Porter, Joan Olson. We now have case of the day. Once you go to our website or our mobile app, and we are on Instagram. Thank you, Dirk. And we have a lot of effort in education. Specifically, our focus has been through much effort on sonographer educators and training systems and sonographer schools. We have a plug and play curriculum for sonographer training. Uh, we link this to the product labels, webinar, and reference materials. And this Plug and play operation was developed in a, as a joint task force, as you see here, AIUM, ARDMS, ASE, ICAS, IAC, and SDMS, all participating under one umbrella to educate uh, our sonographers. And as I mentioned, this is our 
um, mobile app. Uh, it's quick, simple. Please, everybody, if you're not a member, become a member. And also, let's get uh, you on our app. The news monitor, what is that? Well, every two weeks, there'll be the latest activity, the greatest articles, three top articles that uh, are scanned by Robin Adams. And you can always access us through our info uh, on our website and send in excellent articles or comments that we would like to see. Uh, we have much more involved in this, such as Bubble News, uh, Case of the Day, Bubble Blog, uh, and uh, uh, links to the sponsor and educational announcements. So join our website. It's very extensive. Uh, and if you have questions, please forward them on uh, within the info section. Again, here's our QR code. Become part of our conversation. We have a, a number of social media contacts, as Sharon and Jordy will soon tell you. Uh, the website, uh, Twitter, formerly Twitter, X now, Instagram, which is just new to us, and we're happy to be involved. And again, it's always through the efforts of collaboration of our sponsors that we are able to bring this material forward. The platinum is Brocco and Lanthius, Gold GE Healthcare, Silver is Canon, Mindray, Phillips, Siemens. And the bronze is Denton's, Fat Robin Studios, Northwest Imaging, of course, Custom Media Lab, Live Media, and uh, Med Mentor. And we appreciate this support from Brocco, Lanthus, and G Healthcare to conduct the ICUS Connect, which is our new mobile app. Today's agenda is fun. It should be interesting for all with good friends, colleagues, and experts in the field. Uh, we'll start with Wilson. He'll lead off to Sharon, then to Jordy. We'll end with uh, Q&A. And thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to your questions and for you joining us uh, on the app and as a member of ICUS. Thank you again. Hi, Steve, Darren, Jordan. Uh, I hope everyone is listening well to me. It's such an honor being here with you uh, in this uh, webinar. And our role is to talk evolving therapeutic applications of, uh, of contrast enhancing agents. Um, my, this is my con conflict of interest that relates to the uh, research we are carrying out in Sao Paulo, mainly uh, sponsorship for materials to carry out a some thrombolysis research. And uh, in advance, I'd like to thank Dr. Jonathan Lindner and Cheryl Move to help me with part of this presentation. So our objective today is just to review the basic science and therapeutic applications, examine the current clinical research utilizing sonothrombolysis, that's uh, what the, the trial we are doing in Brazil, and to recognize the potential clinical impact in new trials. So there are a lot of novel applications of ultrasound uh, enhanced agents that are being researched in the world. Uh, in the, especially in, in looking for uh, therapeutic impact, not only diagnostic, in microvascular imaging, in non-obstructive coronary artery disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, placental imaging, uh, microgravity, atherosclerosis, physiology, we have a lot of papers going on, uh, ischemic memory, memories, among others, and as I will show you in more detail, uh, sonothrombolysis. Uh, the first um, very important clinical rule, and my friend Steve Feinstein is one of the leaders in this field, is the uh, observation of uh, plaque neovascularization, which is a marker, which is a marker of uh, the risk, cardiovascular risk for plaque rupture. And one can see intraplaque uh, neovascularization through the observation of the presence of microbubbles inside these plaques. And, and this is very important because it can predict uh, plaque rupture. Uh, in this uh, paper by Mantella, uh, they did uh, 
the intraplaque, they look at the intraplaque neovascularization in order to predict coronary artery disease. Since coronary disease is a diffuse disease, it's uh, once you find uh, inflammation, and inflammation is a systemic uh, uh, problem, uh, you find inflammation in, in a carotid plaque, you uh, can predict uh, cardiovascular events. You can predict coronary artery disease with a very high sensitivity just by uh, observing in the carotid, carotid the artery, the, 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 the intracarotid plaque, and you can predict uh, uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, patients with uh, neovascularization in the carotid artery have more coronary events than those who don't. And you can do it easily by, uh, before, stress echocardiology. This paper by Huang, they looked at the prognostic value of intraplaque neovascularization in patients that were already undergoing stress echocardiography. They used the, the same value of contrast and looked at the plaques. They tried to find neovascularization. They demonstrated that patients undergoing stress echo, they had the three to five times more risk if they have this uh, carotid plaque neovascularization. And therefore, the association of detection of local changes, ischemic changes during stress echocardiography can be improved by uh, observation of intraplaque uh, neovascularization, by, by the simple observation of the presence of microbubbles inside this plaque. And it has, uh, this technique has several other applications. Using vasodilator stress in patients undergoing uh, cardiomyopathy because they are known to have an a, a imperfect distribution of uh, capillaries, especially in the hypertrophied myocardium, one can demonstrate that they have very low coronary artery uh, flow reserve in the areas of hypertrophy. And that may be related to cardiac events and fibrosis. And you can document that quite well with uh, the use of myocardial, quantitative techniques of myocardial blood flow using contrast echocardiography. And also in experimental studies today, we can also see that you, in the third day of uh, this knockout mice uh, of myocardial infarction, you, uh, you, uh, you, you have a lot of interleucin-1 activation, inflammation, and plaque growth. You can inhibit it, uh, and you can demonstrate the de decrease of plaque, intraplaque, the plaque size, and you can inhibit the interleucin, which is an uh, 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 signaling of inflammation. And therefore, you may uh, be able to find new ways to, to decrease plaque inflammation in, in acute ischemic diseases. So uh, these therapies, they, they are called uh, teranostics, are therapies that are involved in, somehow in, in a... Diag uh, are therapies that derive from a diagnostic method. Then that's actually common in, in almost all imaging modalities, nuclear medicine, radiology, MRI, and now ultrasound. And there are several areas of interest in research. And it's not new. This is a, a report from the Montefiore Hospital that was uh, presented in the Life magazine in 1949 demonstrated that the uh, 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 iodine uh, therapy uh, cured thyroid cancer in this patient. So this is Theranostics. And Theranostics has, uh, has grown in interest in the past few years. If you look at the this PubMed search that I did uh, uh, just yesterday, you see that from 2008, there was nearly no uh, paper with this, these keywords. And now the number is growing uh, every year. So the interest is very big. And in the area of thrombotic diseases, and here we are going to talk to you about uh, acute coronary syndromes, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has evolved in, in trials, uh, several trials actually have uh, been carried out around the world with a lot of success. And... Actually, sonotrombolysis is a technique that uh, 
you you intermittently use high mechanical index ultrasound to destroy the bubbles that penetrate inside the cavities of the thrombi uh, uh, intermittently. So you wait until the bubbles come in, you destroy, you wait, and then they come in. And together with this lytic, the rupture effect, you also have shear stress in the endothelium and a lot of uh, release of nitro oxide. And that increases microvascular flow to the myocardium. The first work actually that looked at it in an experimental model was this one by Tsutsui many years ago. She was a co-worker at the Heart Institute with us at the time. We went to, to Nebraska, worked with, worked with Tom Porter in this paper published in 2006, where she looked at 12 dogs with thrombotic occlusions of a bypass using the one megahertz ultrasound in the femoral artery that was occluded and imaged it with uh, a vascular ultrasound uh, probe. She demonstrated that even during occlusion, there are few ch channels inside this thrombi. And while intermittently uh, using a 0.5 megahertz, uh, actually physiotherapy transducer at the time, she turned it on and off the transducer. After a few minutes, she observed that she, small channels started to become bigger until uh, by 30 minutes she, minutes, she had already uh, recanalized almost 6% of this graph. So, in, inspired on that, and especially in Brazil, knowing that the current uh, therapies for acute coronary syndromes are available for only 40% of the population, uh, also uh, most of the patients, even if they have access to fibrinolytic therapy, Many physicians uh, in tertiary, in, sec in primary and secondary hospitals, they are afraid to use it because of hemorrhagic complications. And even if they use it, uh, up to four hours uh, of uh, chest pain very early, uh, we can only open about 60% of the coronary arteries. And even if we do all of that, if we uh, treat the patients early, if we use lytics, or even if we do a primary angioplasty before two hours, we still, we have, despite the, the uh, adequate uh, opening of the epicardial artery, we still have the no reflow phenomena that persists in about 35% of the case. So it's a, it's a big problem because even if you treat them uh, uh, properly, uh, these patients may still evolve with left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure. So we today have few methods uh, being studied to access the micro microcirculation, which is the current problem of acute myocardial infarction, especially. So because of that, we designed this trial at the Heart Institute. Uh, this trial was designed in 2015 and published in Jack in 2019. That uh, where we randomized patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction with less than six hours of pain. So this is the, the flow chart of the patients. During the study period, 3,479 patients arrived uh, at our department. Uh, a lot of patients were excluded because they had fibrinolysis. We plan to study just patients without any lead therapy. So, uh, we got 303, uh, uh, 300, sorry, uh, this number here is uh, 203, yes, that's, that's correct, patients uh, in this study. 100 patients were randomized from Friday to, 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 to from Monday to Friday during the day, and 203 patients arrived at night and on weekends you, and were just followed for the purpose of observing the, the coronary artery, the spontaneous coronary artery patients. These 100 patients, all of them underwent primary PCI. When they arrived, they were being prepped for the primary PCI in, in our emergency department. They were randomized to stone thrombolysis before, during the way to the cat lab, and after the cat, cat lab for a total time of 50 minutes, and uh, control, which were just primary PCI. They were just uh, treated uh, in a standard fashion. Uh, there were a lot of measurements that were done in, regarding the cardiac function of these patients, ejection fraction, volumes, uh, myocardial infarction size by 72-hour 
uh, MRI and in my longitudinal myocardial strain was also performed. Uh, we also looked at their ST elevation in, uh, in ST resolution during sonothrombolysis. We demonstrated that the control group had only 4% of ST resolution af uh, until after uh, PCI. On the other hand, 32% of patients had ST elevation resolution that were treated by, by sonothrombolysis. Uh, during the first injection, when the patients arrived in the cath lab, during the first injection, we demonstrated that patients that were treated by sonothrombolysis, they had 48% of their, their uh, culprit artery was already opened. In the control group, only 20%, and in the reference group, 21%. This is uh, one of the cases that we, we, we have seen and studied. It's a 52-year-old male with hypertension and dyslipidemia that arrived at, at our emergency department with uh, uh, one hour and 40 minutes continuous uh, strong chest pain. This is the electrocardiogram on the top. One can see the ST elevation. And, for, and 12 minutes later, you can see some ST resolution already in the EKG. And Interestingly, the left image is the image at arrival with myocardial contrast. One can appreciate this very severe left ventricular dysfunction with a very large perfusion defect and wall motion abnormality, both. Still in the emergency department, doing flashes after the, the high MI, intermittent high MI flashes that were performed every 20 seconds uh, in apical 4, 2, and 3 chamber view we could observe the reperfusion of the risk area, just this lateral apical segment that had, still had some perfusion defect, but we could see clearly that the coronary artery was already open at this point, but the wall motion wasn't recovered yet because uh, of myocardial stunning. And the right image just demonstrates after PCI, we could save, so the, the microvasculature was almost all intact in this patient, uh, demonstrating that uh, the myocardial infarction size probably was uh, quite small. At follow-up, MRI demonstrated a, small, a very small size myocardial infarction at 72 hours, and the stent was uh, perfectly opened. And this is very interesting. This is the longitudinal strain on this patient. I, I, uh, immediately post-PCI, it was 10%, 10.1%. 72 hours later, it was 11.2, and six months later, it was 15.5. These are the MRI findings. The total myocardial infarction, not just no reflow, was 40 grams uh, in, in, in the... Sorry, it's inverted here. It was 40 grams in, in, the, in the control group and 29 grams in the therapy group. And the, my, the ejection fraction in all patients, they improved along the follow-up in both groups, but improved more in the therapy, in the sonothrombolysis group. And the same thing happened with uh, longitudinal strain. One can see that uh, the longitudinal strain was around the 12.5 in both groups, it was similar at uh, immediate, uh, the status immediately post-PCI and, inc and increased in both groups, but increased much more in patients that underwent thrombolysis. A new paper that we just uh, published also, also demonstrates that this therapy has impact in more uh, refined markers of function. This is the last atrial strain that improved more in patients uh, treated by thrombolysis than in patients that underwent uh, a conventional therapy. We are now carrying out a phase three clinical trial where our aim is to enroll 540 patients. We have four clinical arms. We are looking at ST elevation MI, patients with MI that underwent primary treatment with lytic therapy, patients with no ST elevation MI and stable angina, and patients that are in primary hospitals they come in an ambulance doing sonothrombolysis. At this point, we randomize it for all of those groups except the ambulance, uh, 99 patients already. 
and we already so, see some tendencies in results. This is the subgroup four, which is where the sonotronolysis is performed only after PCI. We see that longitudinal strain apparently is getting better in these nine. 19 patients that we already randomized. And there are other applications. This, this was a case we treated uh, the kid, uh, uh, one year old girl was dying of pulmonary artery uh, occlusion by thrombosis. We performed sonothrombolysis with a two, two, 20 mi mi microsecond uh, software in order to try to open the pulmonary artery of this, this baby. Um, this is the baseline pulmonary artery injection. We see that the left pulmonary artery is completely uh, occluded. And this is 24 hours of alteplasm. We tried that before, but you see there is no circulation in the upper pulmonary lung. Oxygen sat saturation is 64. And 50 minutes later, of, uh, after 50 minutes of sun thrombolysis, oxygen saturation went up to 78. And you could see a lot of um, vessels that were open, especially in the upper lung. This is our team in Brazil. I'd like to thank Steve and Linda for the opportunity. And uh, I'll be open for questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wilson. That was fantastic. And of course, that last case was dramatic. Thanks. Uh, look forward to having a discussion uh, about this in the Q&A session. Uh, let's move on now to uh, Sharon Mulvey, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm actually in Montreal today, so coming to you from a different location in Canada, but we've got you covered around the globe. That was a wonderful talk, Wilson. Thank you so very much. Um, it's a pleasure Thank to you. be here with everyone today. Um, I'm hoping you can all, I'm trying to get presentation mode up. Here we go. There we go. Can you all see my slides? Thank you. Okay. Yes. So um, I'm uh, to build on uh, Wilson's excellent uh, talk. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, some specifics of uh, optimizing your system uh, for both the uh, LVO and uh, perfusion. Um, given the uh, time uh, frame, we'll have to actually uh, do this uh, in a rather generic way. Uh, but as we know, there are different systems and different agents, and uh, it is important for you to optimize to uh, what your system is. But these are general principles. Uh, these are my disclosures. That's the objective, as I've just gone over. And just to quickly review, uh, I think it's important to recall what the indications are for ultrasound enhancing agents. Now, Wilson has shown us some very exciting uh, future applications, but right now in the here and now, we should be using uh, contrast every day in our labs for the assessment of LV structure, function, volumes, and ejection fraction. Um, and even though off-label perfusion is readily within our reach to be able to perform and to get incremental uh, value uh, from that uh, because of the baseline imaging that we do is really in the same uh, technique uh, setup of your machine uh, for LVO. And it's just one more uh, step to acquire perfusion information. And then it's very important to be able to recognize the advantage of seeing improved structural assessment of the uh, heart, uh, particularly apical structures. And uh, we've talked about this before in this setting, um, myocardial infarction complications. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about tumors and thrombi again, because that is very helpful. Perfusion information incrementally can help differentiate. Um, there's also uh, new applications that you heard uh, so eloquently from uh, Wilson. So as we know, if we don't see the, uh, the endocardial border adequately, then that's an indication for being able to utilize contrast. But I really like this diagram that uh, Jonathan Linder put together uh, with respect to the advantages that we get, not only just from uh, using contrast, not just because we want to see the image better, but it, we have to put it in the clinical context. So in a patient, for example, that has... Um, chest pain where you can't see the image, um, that's obviously an indication, but even if the image is good, we can get additional information by utilizing contrast and particularly perfusion information is in that uh, category. Here's an example of a patient um, that uh, 
you know, uh, perhaps uh, clearly there's an apical infarct in this two chamber view here. Um, I hope that you're all using in your infarct patients contrast in imaging because you never know what's hiding uh, in the uh, post infarct patient. And in this case, it was impossible to see that uh, left ventricular apical thrombus without the utilization of contrast. So that's a particularly uh, important application. So how do we do it? Um, well, we want to set up our machine properly, and you're going to, depending, as I said, on your system, it will be a different uh, vendor preset, but there are general principles that are followed by all of the systems. And that is to be able to use uh, a very low mechanical index a strategy, and that means between 0.1 and 0.2, and to use not second harmonic imaging, which is what we started out with decades ago, but to use our fundamental nonlinear multipulse imaging uh, perfusion strategy or uh, technique uh, strategies. And this involves uh, such techniques that the vendors have incorporated as uh, uh, amplitude modulation and uh, pulse inversion imaging. Our ultrasound enhancing agents can be administered either by bolus uh, with a flush, uh, either uh, quickly, but generally we don't give quick boluses because there's no advantage in doing that. We give slow flushes to be able to see the contrast enter into the right ventricle, and then we stop flushing, and then we watch it go into the left ventricle, and then we get the perfusion phase afterwards. Infusion uh, with a pump is another way of doing it. And some agents, uh, this is a global audience we have here. So as you know, some agents are approved uh, with infusion pumps uh, that come with them. And um, that can be helpful, uh, particularly with respect to quantitating uh, perfusion imaging. And then we have to evaluate what we see. We have to be able to evaluate the effect of the contrast that we've given in the settings that we've put together. And is the contrast effect right or too little or too much, kind of the Goldilocks principle. And here's an example here of um, what's going on. Well, this is an apical three chamber view, and you can see that there's a large left ventricular apical aneurysm, and this is called swirling. The contrast is swirling around, and um, often you get this because you have a very large ventricle and it's difficult to fill that entire ventricle. Regardless, we are getting good endocardial uh, border definition, but if you wanted to improve this, then you would give a little more contrast or you could decrease the, the mechanical index. At the other end of the spectrum, this is a, a case where we have, this is a Mayo format uh, with the LV on the left, and we have uh, the um, absence of good endocardial visualization from the base to the mid segments because of attenuation. So we have too much contrast here in the apex, and that is preventing the uh, reflection of the, uh, from the microbubbles from occurring deeper down in the chest, and we need to reduce the concentration and or uh, we can wait for this injection for the contrast to clear somewhat, or we could administer a high mechanical index pulse to be able to uh, make a more homogeneous left ventricular opacity uh, filling. Now, what did I just talk about there? I talked about the fact that to optimize our ultrasound equipment, we have to understand the physics a little bit. And we have to understand that microbubbles interact with ultrasound this is just one of my most favorite videos uh, from uh, Nico uh, de Jong in uh, Rotterdam at the Erasmus University. And Nico shared this with me decades ago. And you can see the high uh, frame rate here, 25 million frames per second. And this is a single microbubble that is oscillating in an acoustic field. And you can just see the expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction that is occurring in that microbubble field and in, in that acoustic field rather. And uh, this uh, is uh, rather unique amongst contrast agents uh, and modalities. So um, because we can uh, have the reflection, not only with linear backscatter, but we utilize this nonlinear resonant uh, activity to be able to enhance detection of the microbubbles so that where we're seeing them is at a, a best at a mechanical index of 0.1 to 0.2, as I have mentioned. And that's also where we have the least amount of tissue harmonics so that we are able to see the signal of the microbubble best. And we know that if we increase the mechanical index further, that those expansions and contractions will actually cause disruption of the microbubble such that uh, cavitation occurs and the microbubbles will be depleted. Now, how do we use this? 
we use, this is the uh, range that we have talked about uh, for what we um, define uh, in the mechanical indices as to very low, low and intermediate or high mechanical indices. So an example, I told you that in general, uh, LVO uh, imaging is best at very low mechanical index between 0.1 and 0.2 with a um, fundamental nonlinear uh, strategy. But in certain uh, clinical situations, such as non-compaction, uh, where you have uh, a thin, uh, uh, non a thin uh, compacted subendocardial myocardium and a, and a thicker non-compacted subendocardial myocardium, where you want to be able to differentiate these uh, uh, invaginations of the myocardium, what happens is that you know, you can actually, because there's myocardial perfusion in that uh, non-compacted area, and there's left ventricular pacification, you can actually make it all blend together so that it appears like this. If you're at very low mechanical uh, in, uh, index imaging, that you can see, it's really hard to see those uh, trabeculations. Whereas if you turn up the mechanical index and you deplete the microbubbles uh, within the uh, myocardium that is forming those trabeculations, then you can much better see how the uh, left ventricular opacification is penetrating down between the trabeculations. So this is one of those little uh, tips about like uh, there's rules, but then there's exceptions. And if you're suspecting non-compaction in your patient, then you should use a higher mechanical index. So what about for perfusion? Well, I already alluded to that. Um, I've said that indeed you set up your machine for uh, LVO and you're really halfway there to be able to do perfusion imaging. Very low mechanical index imaging, fundamental nonlinear multipulse, slow infusion, um, and you can either do that by hand or using a pump of your microbubble agent. And then that additional step which is the flash or the high mechanical impulse, which we generally uh, deliver between a 0.8 and 1.2 mechanical index um, set at about five to 20 frames. And what we wanna see is complete depletion, i.e. the myocardium appears blackened uh, after the flash so that then we can watch for the replenishment over subsequent cardiac cycles. And what we look for is both the rate of the replenishment, i.e. representing the velocity or the flow into the myocardium, and we look at the plateau of that um, uh, video intensity, and that represents the myocardial blood volume. And then we interpret it. And generally in our labs, we're doing qualitative interpretation, but if you're going to do research studies and these studies have been done uh, to be able to actually calculate myocardial blood flow reserve, uh, quantitative assessment can be done, but you need a steady state of my myocardial um, microbubble flow and that requires uh, the infusion pump set up. In general, we expect that within four to five cardiac cycles at rest, the myocardium should replete after it has been depleted by a flash. And with stress, it should be within two cardiac cycles because of the increased uh, heart rate and stroke volume and cardiac output. And if this is not the case, then perfusion is considered to be either delayed if it's slow or if it isn't, microbubbles aren't seen at all, then completely absent. You can also assess the degree of the um, uh, transmurality of the uh, perfusion. So this work, look at this, Kevin Wade did this back almost three decades ago now, beautiful work uh, showing here is a uh, representative of a myocardial segment and the uh, uh, every cardiac cycle imaging the filling uh, with the microbubbles as we see uh, uh, the uh, time intervals. And this is representative of what we do on our systems. We give a high mechanical index flash to deplete all the microbubbles. We watch with each cardiac cycle as they replenish and we can generate these time intensity curves quantitatively, or we can use this similar assessment qualitatively looking at the rate of appearance as well as the uh, intensity uh, of the um, appearance. And if it is reduced, then that would be consistent with an ischemic response. I've gone through this pretty fast, but all of this information and the actual details of the uh, to refer to with the different agents and uh, different strategies for administering are outlined in the appendix of this excellent document that was published in 2014, which is the guidelines for uh, cardiac sonographers from ASC. And then more recently, we have updated the uh, uh, CUS exam protocols in the um, uh, ECHO Research and Practice, which is the uh, journal of the British Society of ECHO. And this is all available on your app 
as well. Very easily, just go to clinical practice protocol tools and you can just download the PDF right away from there. And this goes over the merits of dilution versus bolus, hand infusion, drip infusion, and pump infusion. I'd be happy to answer additional questions during the Q&A. A particularly ap important application is in stress echo. And this is where we have here uh, the uh, rest images on the left and the uh, post uh, exercise images on the right, four chamber in the Mayo format on the top and uh, apical long axis on the bottom. And, you know, this was actually read as an initially normal study, a little bit of a question here about the apex, but the patient came back because clinically it was very suspicious that uh, there was ischemia uh, in the history. And you can see that when you get a proper image of the left ventricle and the regional walls, you can see indeed, and I'm sorry it didn't play again for us, uh, but uh, it's interesting, let me stop this one for a second. I'm using a borrowed computer here. But the point here is that the ventricle was foreshortened. And you can see actually how the myocardium was much thicker here. And when the myocardium is not thick, then it is um, in a true uh, long axis of the ventricle, there's a definite anterior apical wall, antroceptal apical wall motion abnormality and an LED stenosis was there. So beyond just uh, making uh, the endocardial definition, Using contrast during stress enables us to be able to hone in and get the images much more quickly to see completely the endocardium, but prevents apical foreshortening, which can really reduce your sensitivity in the detection of wall motion abnormalities. Now, what about the addition of perfusion to our optimal wall motion assessment with optimal LVO. And here's an example on the top with dobutamine. And this is uh, the LV on the right here on the conventional format. And you can see at rest, there's normal LV function, no regionals. And at peak stress over here with dobutamine, there's a clear wall motion abnormality from the mid infro apex, all mid infro septum rather, all the way around the apex and a, a, a complementary perfusion defect. So you could say, well, you can see this anyway, this wall motion abnormality, but you get certainly confirmation that there is a transmurality of the uh, perfusion uh, abnormality. And this was a very high grade LED stenosis. This is an exercise. And when we do um, exercise, we obviously administer the contrast about 30 seconds before the patient gets off the treadmill uh, in the same dose that you gave at rest. And this is on the uh, resting images here on the lower left and in the immediate post-stress uh, images on the right. And you can see again, this large regional wall motion abnormality with an associated perfusion defect. In our guidelines, it actually states that we should be using perfusion or we certainly can uh, utilize perfusion during stress echo, even though it is an off-label application. And uh, the sensitivity is improved as well as the prognostic value in extensive work that has been done, particularly by Tom Porter and colleagues. So particular scenarios where there may be additional benefit uh, during stress echo for the perfusion information would be with in the presence of left bundle branch block when it's often difficult with the dyssynergic motion of the uh, the ventricle uh, to be able to uh, establish a regional wall motion abnormality presence. But if there's abnormal perfusion, uh, this can certainly uh, affirm that. Um, similarly, in rest images, there's particular incremental value in the assessment of masses and intracardiac masses. A thrombus has no perfusion as demonstrated here, whereas a metastatic tumor is highly perfused as demonstrated here. And a myxoma is in the intermediate zone with relatively uh, sparse perfusion, but present to stromal type tissue. So again, I remind you more details on the de specifics of uh, uh, the um, mechanics of administering uh, contrast are in these two excellent documents. You can access them right now. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I will look forward to your questions in the uh, question period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, as always, comprehensive and exciting. Uh, the final speaker for today, uh, before we move to the question and answer, is uh, Jordi Strom, and uh, look forward to your presentation and your excitement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and, and thank you, Sharon and Wilson, for, for really sort of eloquently taking us through uh, both sort of the advanced applications 
uh, and novel applications of contrast enhanced ultrasound and, and echocardiography, as well as sort of optimizing our image utilization. M my sort of task today is to talk to you a little bit about uh, how do you actually implement contrast enhanced ultrasound in your echo lab uh, from a workflow feasibility standpoint, as, as well as from a safety standpoint, to make sure you're following best practices to really maintain uh, be best uh, quality and optimal quality care for our patients while, while getting really some of this incredible, important diagnostic quality information. Here are my disclosures. So uh, we will be talking about um, uh, indications other than left ventricular opacification, which, which as mentioned, is, is the primary indication for which the um, uh, UEAs, or otherwise known as ultrasound enhancing agents, are FDA approved. Uh, we will be using the word uh, UEAs in contrast sort of interchangeably here, and, and that can be somewhat confusing uh, uh, to some people or to, to patients in particular, because ultrasound enhancing agents are different than iodinated contrast. Iodinated contrast that we use for CTs um, can have effects on the kidneys. The ultrasound enhancing agents, uh, microbubbles that we're talking about here do not. And so we, we prefer the term ultrasound enhancing agents or UEAs uh, to that of, of, of contrast when we discuss it in particular with, with patients uh, so as to avoid that, uh, that, that risk understanding. So we'll talk about the indications for UEA use, the evidence base for, for efficacy in practice. Um, we'll understand the best practices for use in the Aqualab and, and role of decision aids. And, and as mentioned earlier, uh, this is a guideline that just came out uh, within the last uh, couple of years um, by uh, our group within the International Contrast Ultrasound Society. I, I would second what Steve said earlier, uh, that the ICAS website is really uh, a wealth of information about um, not only education on, on this very topics, but also sort of giving guidelines and uh, use cases, as well as a number of different sort of case uh, examples of, of use in, in, uh, in multiple different um, settings, not just echocardiography, but also in sort of body radiology, et cetera. So really, really great. Um, and, and this is this uh, uh, guideline documentation that was published in the in the ECHO Research and Practice would, would encourage people to to, re, uh, to read this as well as the AAC guidelines. So what's the problem that we have? I've, Sharon just told you and Wilson just told you of all the great benefits of ultrasound enhancing agents. And yet, if we look at their, their use in the United States, we find a sort of a, a sobering tale. And, and this is data that we pulled. This is one institution, but this was pulled from our institution over 18 years and over almost 100,000 patients. And here you can see on the right, over time is the probability of, of having suboptimal image quality uh, on our, our study. And then the blue is the probability of a patient receiving uh, ultrasound enhancing agents during that same time period. And if we just looked at the, the uh, rates over time of uh, ultrasound enhancing agents, we might say, well, we're doing really great. We're, we're improving our use of ultrasound enhancing agents over time, uh, uh, as is sort of guideline indicated. Um, but that only tells part of the story. If we look at the overall denominator of, of um, the patients who potentially could qualify for use of ultrasound enhancing agents, uh, th that tells a slightly different story. Uh, in general, in this particular uh, case, only 2.6% of our echoes received ultrasound and enhancing agents. I I'm, I'm happy to report it. It no longer is the case. We, we're up to about 40% of inpatients and about 24% uh, overall uh, use. For, for but, but in general, we know that about 10 to 20% of, of patients have suboptimal image quality across the board. So seven, and consistent with that, we, we had about 17% of our own data, were, uh, our echocardiograms were suboptimal. Well, the ultrasound enhancing agent um, use did increase by about 0.3% per year. Suboptimal image quality increased actually faster than that. And then there, the reasons for that are, are multifold. Uh, in general, we're using echo in a broader population. Uh, they're expanding indications for contrast to ultrasound and for echocardiography as a, as a whole. And also, we looked at this and we found that the weight of our patients and the patients that were coming to us um, was, was significantly higher, which we know is associated with, with image quality. Um, Use was proportionally greater amongst inpatients. I think we see this in general in multiple for multiple reasons, not uh, the least of which is inpatients are uh, acutely ill and, and require these uh, decisions to be made uh, at a point of care uh, basis, but also that inpatients have IVs. And so it's somewhat easier to give the agents than an outpatient who may be walking off the street. 
So if we look at uh, not just our center, but sort of take a broader picture view, this is uh, data that will be published shortly in Jack Imaging. These are data from 11 million adults receiving uh, echocardiograms and 740,000 uh, receiving stress echoes across uh, 2,400 sites in, in the United States. This is based on a, a large claims data set that essentially captures 80% of the claims of the of people in the United States. And what we find is at the top here, you can see that uh, uh, on the left is, is transthoracic echo, and on the right is stress echocardiography, and darker colors um, indicate more utilization. So um, uh, on the left here, you can see that, for example, Texas here uh, is a high utilizer of transthoracic echoes. Uh, on the right, you can see that they also use stress echocardiography uh, uh, quite, quite frequently. At the bottom, however, in the red, you can see the percentage of those transthoracic echoes or stress echocardiograms that for which uh, contrast was used. And you can see a slightly different story that if you look at states that are high utilizers of echocardiography, such as Texas, Florida, New York, uh, in fact, actually, they may not be the highest users of ultrasound enhancing agents. And there's wide geographic variability. Um, so ultrasound enhancing agents in general were used in about 6.8% of outpatient transthoracic echoes and about 21% of stress echocardiograms across the country. And if we look at regional variability in that, um, particularly if we look by state, you can see that in Minnesota, topping the list, 19.7% of all the echocardiograms uh, that, were, um, that, that were administered um, uh, received uh, ultrasound enhancing agents versus at, at the bottom, we have 1.1% uh, of those in, in Delaware. So depending on who you, where you are as a patient walking into a medical facility, you have a vastly different likelihood of receiving contrast uh, agents and, and potentially getting diagnostic quality imaging. And so there's a real need to be able to standardize our practice across uh, this. And we look to see are there other sort of factors that are, contribute to who uses ultrasound enhancing agents. We found that, um, and this is consistent with prior data that we've also published, um, um, that there seems to be a lower utilization in, in females. And in prior data, that, that uh, was true even when adjusting for suboptimal image quality. So uh, it is consistent with sort of the overall disparities, sex disparities that we see in the receipt of, of echocardiography and, and other types of services in, in females versus males, uh, but speaks to the need to standardize this approach. And then as people age, um, they, they are more likely to receive uh, ultrasound enhancing agents, Medicare beneficiaries, of course, overall being older, um, do get um, ultrasound enhancing agents more frequently. And then as the, the uh, somebody's risk of comorbidities or, or comorbidity burden increases, um, there seems to be a, a higher rate of utilization uh, of, uh, of contrast. Adjusting for all of these, factors, including site factors. We did find that sites that were using this were more frequently large. They were rural, nonprofit, and teaching facilities. But adjusting for site characteristics and patient characteristics, we still found about a 4.4-fold difference in use across site that wasn't explained. And this was despite adjusting for things like a cardiologist experience, the number of, of echoes that they do at a given center, they, the number of discharges at, at a given center. So uh, really, I think there's th what this speaks to is that there's a large variability in how we practice and that there is a need for better standardization of our use. And when we look at some of the reasons for this, this is from the ASC trend survey um, from 2021. Uh, ASC uh, comes out with a, a survey every year that they survey the, the membership on uh, a variety of different questions. And uh, one of which, or several of them, uh, relate to contrast use. And so in this particular one, they said, please rate the degree to which you find the following tasks difficult. At not, um, we, we expected to see things like, well, you're, you're, you're in fact using a lot uh, asking us to do a, a lot more um, uh, procedures and things. We now have strain. We have uh, other technologies that we have to use, the longer exams. And that that did factor in. Um, that was number that was in the yellow box here, expanded protocols or longer studies. But in fact, the most difficult thing um, for, uh, for members who responded to the survey was, was body habits, technically difficult patients due to body habits. So this is a huge issue. And when you then look at why um, are ultrasound enhancing agents not used um, for left ventricular pacification? The top thing on the top of the list is it's too much effort to administer. And so we can talk about that, but that is a, a, is a big barrier to use. And this makes sense. If you have, for example, uh, one hour in your exam, 
And you have to wait for an IV nurse to come place an IV to administer the contrast. And it takes them 45 minutes to, to do that. Then you only have 15 minutes left to scan. And so as a result, many people forego the use of contrast. And, and there are ways around that. And there are ways to just try to predict this ahead of time. But uh, but that's one of the many reasons. The the other uh, reason in the here, seen here in the red is that sonographers in general aren't trained in the use of administration of, of contrast. Um, uh, but very, very... Um, and, and in fact, if you dive into that a little bit uh, more so, what do you think is the top driver to increase appropriate use of contrast in your, for LVO in, in your laboratory? The top topping list is the ability of sonographers to insert IVs. Um, we'll, we'll get to this in, in a second, but most sonographers leave school, unlike their counterparts in MRI or CT, without the ability or the training to place IVs. And um, Many and many places, we we were very fortunate within uh, BIDMC to to be able to to push through the hospital the ability for sonographers to in, inject contrast, and we are are now um, all of our sonographers now uh, now give contrast. Um, but but in many places, the ability to for sonographers to inject contrast represents a huge barrier. When you ask about where are the two care settings that are where LVO is uh, ultrasound enhancing agents for LVO is most underutilized, you see that at the top is the hospital outpatient. That makes sense. These patients walk into your office and they don't have IVs, and placement of that IV is a really critical step in driving forward use of these agents. Uh, number two on those list is actually the ICU, where everybody has IVs, and those decisions are critically important. Um, so we'll come back to that as well. So this was a, a, a survey that was put on uh, by Sharon and, and others uh, from, from ICAS um, uh, several years ago. Um, it was administered to program directors of sonographer programs. And, and the, the high level uh, take home is that only 18% offer any kind of IV insertion and only 5% certify sonographers on IVs. And why is that? Well, if you ask why you're not, you don't have contrast enhanced ultrasound in your curriculum, one of the major barriers is that current educators don't have sufficient expertise. It's a recurrent cycle. If you didn't learn it uh, in, in your training, you can't teach somebody else that same thing. And so uh, these are uh, these are real big problems. They're, they're workflow problems, but they're also educational problems. Um, and so that's why we are here to help provide some of that education and to help uh, push the, the field along um, towards uh, towards meeting this these needs. So let's talk about the when. So why, when would you use uh, ultrasound enhancing agents? And I would counter that by saying, when would you not use ultrasound enhancing agents? There are a number of benefits to, to use, uh, some of which have been mentioned already, um, but I uh, wanna reinforce uh, these. So uh, in general, the inter-observer variability um, between um, CMR, uh, cardiac MRI and, and echo is reduced when you use uh, ultrasound enhancing agents in terms of quantification of ejection fraction, which we know is important for management of a number of disease states. Um, regional wall motion abnormality is uh, an inter-observer very agreement uh, compared to unenhanced imaging is also improved and it improves the confidence, sensitivity and specificity of stress interpretation in the setting of technically difficult uh, image quality. Of course, um, as, as Sharon mentioned, um, it has a, a, a really important role in distinction of intracardiac masses and distinguishing in particular avascular and vascular structures. Uh, Sharon has also done some seminal work looking at improvement of uh, identification of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you have a crowded apex, you're not sure what's going on, give the contrast agents, you can see oftentimes uh, identify apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where it may not otherwise have been suspected. And in particular, you're able to identify if the patient has an, an apical aneurysm, which we know is not only associated with risk of, of thromboembolism, but also arrhythmic risk. Uh, for TEE, um, it's a little bit different because in general, we're using high frequency probes, but but uh, we, we, we find that improves the confidence for thrombus exclusion prior to cardioversion, and at least in one small study, may actually reduce the rate of embolic events when used. For LVO pacification, um, we, we know that it improves uh, accuracy, reproducibility, and reader confidence, uh, Many, most of which with diagnostic quality images, and lowers downstream testing and cost as a result of, of, of that. 
Um, as mentioned earlier, you can use it for, for stress uh, testing, and you can use it in the setting of inotropic stress, but you could also, as, as they do uh, frequently in Europe, use vaso high-dose vasodilators to, to identify it. So in the setting of inotropic stress, dopamine it improves uh, coronary artery disease detection versus wall motion abnormalities alone, defines the extent of this, and, and may improve upon wall motion analysis in identifying those at risk of, of death or MI. For vasodilator stress and perfusion, it's shown equivalent specificity and higher sensitivity compared to, to SPECT and, and enhanced prognostic value versus SPECT. And of course, as mentioned earlier in left bundle branch block, these really uh, challenging cases to interpret, it improves the detection of ischemia versus SPECT alone. Quantitatively, um, it, it, it can improve um, the detection of, of ischemia and, and has a sensitivity and specificity greater than 80% versus angiography and provides superior prognostic information versus qualitative analysis. So lots of reasons to use it. How do we use it? So uh, this has been sort of uh, brought up by Mike Main, but, but reinforced here that there are four overriding practices that really heavily influence ultrasound enhancing agent use in your practice. One is the presence of a standing order for ultrasound enhancing agent administration. At, at BI, when, when somebody orders an echocardiogram, it's ordered as with or without contrast. And so that gives uh, the physician order already in place so that the sonographers at the time of administration are able to give uh, these, these agents. The second is sonographers enabled to make the decision and administer ultrasound enhancing agents at the point of care. If the sonographer has to ask a physician every single time to be able to give uh, an agent, it, it, that's a cumbersome uh, barrier to workflow. And, and in general, we were able to, um, to get this through our administration um, uh, in, a, in a safe fashion by both setting up a, a sort of safety uh, training program, but but also uh, recognizing that other uh, uh, other technologists may have used um, uh, medications in a supervised setting. So, for example, ophthalmologic techs administer timolol eye drops at our institution under supervised settings. So there is a precedent for use, um, and, and so we we leverage that to really say that this is really an important thing uh, for for our laboratory and and and. Um, I uh, have um, seen the benefits of it. And the sonographers trained and enabled to place IVs. This is a really huge problem. There, there's a, a large um, uh, group within ICUS that's uh, led by Maria Stanzik um, at Jefferson, who's been working on, on this in general. Um, many people leave training without uh, the, the ability to place IVs. We've locally at BI um, uh, started training and have trained most of our sonographers now to place IVs, but, but in general, um, it's within the SDMS sc scope of practice, it's within the ASC's scope of practice to do. So we just need to get that education to people. And um, we have a really exciting partnership that we're working on um, with the ARDMS to potentially offer a, a training course, a didactic and, and, and practical uh, training course on IV placement that would be open to people outside of, um, of just um, um, just um, um, institutions where, where IV training is, is, is taught in schools so that people have that training um, and are able to bring a certification or certificate to their institution to argue for the, the ability to, to place IVs locally. And then last, um, and very importantly, is the presence of a physician and, and or sonographer advocate. And we, we really see when, when there's a physician and sonographer that work together, that there's a really uh, good synergy that happens there. But having somebody in your center who's really willing to advocate for use and, and try to drive these changes locally is critically important. So when we talk about enabling sonographers, we, we can really help um, the, the workflow in, in two ways. One is we can reduce the decision time. That is the, the time you, you take to be able to decide whether or not you need contrast. Um, and then we can also reduce the administration time, the, the time to administer the contrast itself. So to, to reduce the decision time, we recommend starting with the apical views. We start with the apical triplane and, and our lab, and we get a lot of critical information on this. You, you get to assess image quality. You get to, uh, the image, um, it turns out the, the apical views are best for assessment of image quality. You get all of your cardinal walls in wall motion. And, and in the same heartbeat, you can actually calculate global longitudinal strain. So it's a really great uh, tool. We, we start off in general in most laboratories with a peristal long axis view. That is historical. That's based on the use of end mode. And so there's no real need to start with a peristal long. Uh, you can start with apical views and we find it to be very helpful. Um, and then using a decision aid, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, how to administer, uh, reduce the administration time, have them locally. If you find that you're using mostly in your, in your echo lab, have them on site, have them on the carts. 
bring it with you if you can. Um, enable sonographers to administer via standing order, like I mentioned, and then using a decision aid can help. So this was pioneered um, by, by Leslie Shaw and others at uh, 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 University of Hospitals in, in Cleveland. Uh, they instituted a sonographer-driven protocol. Uh, they did it with a three-month uh, feasibility phase followed by an established phase. And then they, they sort of um, timed it out and looked at a cost-benefit analysis of what, um, what, 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 uh, what they got out of this. And in general, uh, it worked as expected. It improved image quality. 96% of the segments were visualized. And they made a couple of uh, important changes after the feasibility uh, phase, one of which is they made the, the ultrasound contrast physically available in the ICUs and cardiology floors, where it was most commonly used. They trained nurses on, on administration of, of contrast on evenings and weekends. And then they trained the sonographers all in IV placement. And, and what you can see is there was, between the feasibility and established phase, there was a reduction in time, both to decide to use it and also to administer the agents. And for every 10 minutes saved, there was a significant increase in the cost savings from using uh, the, the ultrasound enhancing agents. So in general, this reduces downstream utilization and is, is cost saving to the institution. And so um, thinking about this, arguing in, in the grand picture, this helps re uh, reduce downstream testing. I, I think you can see there's quite a bit of uh, utility. So coming back to the workflow solution, how do you know who to place an IV in. And this was actually uh, a project that one of our, our fellows had, had um, was reading with me and said, wouldn't it be really nice if we can identify who needs an IV uh, ahead of time so we could, we could plan for this? I said, that's brilliant, let's, let's work on that. And so we, we took our data and we split it into um, a three, three quarters de derivation and 25% uh, validation sample. And, and we, we basically created a three item score that was only um, using information that was available prior to image acquisition. And th those three sort of variables that seem to be most important are weight, age, and heart rate. Weight and age make a lot of sense. Heart rate, we think maybe a, a proxy for patient acuity, but they seem to be very important. And what we found is, is if you have a high probability of this score, you could potentially come in early to the lab. So for example, you could have a, a medical assistant uh, calculate this on everybody a week before they come into the lab. And those who are sufficiently high probability come in 15 minutes early, they get their IV placed. It doesn't mean that they need contrast. It just means that um, uh, they need an IV. And then you can make the decision on whether or not to administer the contrast based on your review of the, of the image quality, uh, rather than some consideration about workflow and, and presence of, of an IV. And importantly here, we created the prediction model here, not just to predict um, contrast use, but because the contrast use may be people who got, that's the people who got it, but it doesn't actually include the people who didn't get it, but maybe should have gotten it. And so this predicts not only contrast use, but also suboptimal image quality in outpatients. And I'm happy to report we've we've now externally validated this um, at uh, Mid-America Heart Institute, where they use quite a bit of contrast, um, and it performed very similarly to similarly used uh, clinical scores, such as the chas 2 vasc score, just to predict contrast use alone even. And uh, it's prospectively being uh, being tested. We, we've now credentialed our sonographers here. And um, as mentioned, if you have a, a, an iPhone or an Android, you can pick up and go to the App Store and download the iCUS Connect app, and you should. Um, and if you uh, you can either go to the, the iCUS Connect app or go to the iCUS website and look for the CUS calculator. Um, you can enter in somebody's weight, age, and heart rate, and it will calculate a probability of, of them potentially needing contrast and note that if the probability there is higher than 15%, you should consider the, the use of an IV to support contrast. This is the address for anybody who wants it. So um, changing gears a tiny bit, um, we've talked a lot about the benefits of contrast. Um, what, what are the risks? And in general, the risks are low. Um, we know that in general, there is a allergic reaction or an anaphylactoid reaction, which is related to complement activation in about one in 15,000 cases. This is extremely uncommon. In fact, it is the, the least common uh, um, adverse uh, event of, of all the contrast agents. The uh, ultrasound enhancing agents are the safest of all contrast media. But nevertheless, it is something that can happen because it's anaphylactoid. Somebody doesn't have to have prior exposure to a uh, contrast in order for this to happen. So it is important that we, we recognize this and we, we plan for it. 
So the IAC policy, the Echo Lodge have to have a policy in place for early identification and rapid responses. All personnel, and that includes everybody in your lab, exercise physiologists, nurses, sonographers, physicians, you name it, should be trained on the early identification and rapid responses to these. Allergy kits should be available and accessible. So this is the a picture of the allergy kit we have at BIDMC. We, we readily restock it. We check it every week to make sure that it's, it's full and complete. Um, of note, you can use the code card, but the code card actually has a different dose of epinephrine. It's a different concentration, one in 1,000 versus one in 10,000. So important um, to, to plan for this and, and stock the allergy kits in, in places where you feel that you most uh, need to use them. Most of these events happen early, almost immediately after an injection and, and are, are occur with sort of typical allergic symptoms. And in, in addition, there is a low incidence of temporary back pain, um, uh, possibly related to retention of microbubbles in the glomerular capillaries. And as a result, in, in all cases, we, we recommend diluting these agents, uh, both to reduce the back pain and potentially also to reduce the, the peak serum concentration of these agents, which may or may not be related to, uh, to, to rates of adverse reactions. As mentioned uh, earlier, this is the data from Kevin Way looking at uh, a comparison with other cardiovascular tests. And at the bottom here, you can see that ultrasound enhancing agents are amongst the safest of contrast media, but there is a small risk of uh, serious adverse events that we need to be prepared for. And we exist in risk in all settings in, in, in medicine. We're always making a risk benefit decision. And we're not as, as much per se used to dealing with that in the ultrasound setting, but in the radiology lab, for sure. Um, they are. And in other parts of the hospital, we're absolutely using medications with the understanding that the benefit outweighs the risk. We need to accept a certain amount of risk, even with water. Um, if you drink enough water, you'll have uh, you'll have side effects to that as well. So it is important to, to, to understand that this happens with everything in, in our care, but we need to be prepared. And, and going back to, to this, there's been a, an incredible wealth of data that's been published over the course of really 20 years um, looking at the safety of these agents, both retrospectively and prospectively with all the different agents, uh, looking at uh, outpatients, inpatients, rest and stress. And, and in general, the, the answer is quite clear. There's no deaths or adverse reactions within 48 hours where those rates are incredibly uh, small. Um, and um, in fact, actually, the, this um, particular article that I've highlighted by Mike Main, who's really one of the, the uh, pioneers in this field, I looked at uh, the premier data set and they looked at inpatients receiving this. They found that within 48 hours, people who received contrast were actually less likely to die than, than patients who didn't when adjusted for clinical comorbidities. Now, that um, I don't know whether or not uh, that's because of improved diagnosis or whether that because they are, the people who receive contrast are somehow different, but it certainly... Uh, speaks to the fact that there's not an increased risk um, of, of use compared to non-use. And as a result, um, there's uh, there's been a really amelioration over the time period over the last uh, 20, uh, 30 years of a really a lot of the, the sort of initial concerns, which were based on this 190 cases of severe cardiopulmonary reactions, many of which uh, on further review uh, turned out to not be at all related to, to the contrast at all. Um, so in general, um, our, our recommendations for safety preparedness are to train your staff, leverage the existing clinical educational resources you have, such as ICUS and a clinical application specialist, teach through examples, really critical to teach through examples of what you can do and what you can't do, have staff repeat back safety protocols to make sure they've understood this, and then assess and reassess. We, we do a, a, an annual assessment for all our staff um, to, to make sure that they, um, they understand the protocol, our individual and local safety protocols, as well as uh, the indications for use. Um, plan for a local response, the when, how, and who. So when we recently started using uh, contrast at a, a satellite facility of ours, we, we uh, before we did that, we identified who would be available. And when that person who was going to respond to events was out, who was going to cover them? And having that in place and having that safety plan in place uh, made everybody feel more comfortable about uh, administering these uh, in, in other ages. Uh, again, have allergy kits available and stocked. If you do have issues, um, track them, retain your vial, uh, report the event details to the manufacturers, document those reactions in the chart, um, put it in somebody's allergy list. And, and uh, importantly, I think um, afterwards, uh, number six is a, is a very big one. Um, people can be shocked after something. If, if, you, if this hasn't happened in your facility and it happens, um, people feel emotionally charged and, and, and are really sort of involved. Really, it's important to debrief with your staff on, uh, afterwards on ways that you could improve the response or ways that things that went well, things that didn't go well, and, and to understand where people are coming from from an emotional perspective. 
in, in our lab, we have the cardiology consult fellow um, respond. We know that uh, we, we tell them early on that this is like a STEMI. Uh, they have to drop everything and run if they get they carry a bubble pager. And, it, and if somebody becomes unresponsive, they go right away. Um, but again, un, infrequent uh, circumstance, but we need to be prepared. So thank you all. Um, and we'll take any questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all. Jordy, that, that was great. Uh, Wilson, uh, Sharon. Um, I'm so happy to uh, have you all here. Uh, this is, if we'd add up all the years of experience of using contrast ultrasound, I don't think we want to. Okay, uh, pending questions. Uh, let me just uh, stir the pot a little bit here uh, until we see some questions, but certainly interrupt us at any point with questions. Um, Contrast enhanced ultrasound or using uh, ultrasound enhancement agents dramatically changes the care we provide. Why? Why? Why isn't it used? And I, I understand the IV access. And are there other issues that we're, we're not uh, able to focus on? Why is their geographic distribution so extreme, et cetera? Okay. We, we have a good 15 minutes. I'm sure we can fill it. But uh, Sharon, why don't we start with you? You know, you've been I, in I, several different locations. Let, let's start there. <laughs> you, you've moved around a bit. So you have a very nice perspective of what's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm the traveling uh, contrast uh, uh, groupie. Um, I, uh, I am particularly, um, well, personally, my own experiences, I really do think that it has to be enabled within the lab that you are working. And there has to be a, um, a champion. And there has to be a system. And Jordy beautifully explained, you know, what are the things that the key ingredients to enable um, access. And, and I think that there is, we're in a far different place than we were a couple of decades ago much better place. And I, I do think that it is really, the awareness is definitely out there. I'm actually visiting right now in uh, Montreal. I just gave a talk uh, before our um, conference, uh, at their noon conference. And, you know, this is a very proactive lab, uh, but they haven't actually used it for perfusion yet. And so they're very interested in being able to go that next step, which really they're doing pretty optimal LVO, um, but uh, it's it's just an additional step. So I think that once you have the um, setup in your lab, and there's really no reason not to have that now, um, then it's to gain the experience, have a champion, and then to recognize that you can push the envelope further and to recognize the benefits and always in a safe environment as uh, Jordy so uh, lovely um, outlined. And I'd, I'd like to just say one other quick thing too. It shocks me to see that um, map of the U.S. Uh, with the, you know, the discrepancies there with the utilization uh, particularly when we know I have seen similar maps that look like um, BMIs at, across the country. And we know that probably the need is greatest in our, you know, south, uh, southern uh, states. And a lot of echoes are being done. But what is the quality of those echoes? So it really comes down. That's the bottom line. What is the quality? And if you want to have a quality lab and to be certified, then it is required that you utilize contrast uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. So I won't say any more, but I think that's it. We want to achieve <laughs> excellence and quality, and that's what we're all about. Karen, thank you. Let's, Jordy, let's hear from you, Wilson. And then we're actually getting questions now. So thank you all. Uh, Jordy, take over. Why, why is there such a discrepancy on delivering good care? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's an interesting um, point. You know, if we think about our, MRI or a CT colleagues, nobody would bat an eye if to give gadolinium or to give ionated contrast when indicated. And yet when, here we are in ultrasound and somehow um, the, the use is not what it what it needs to be. And, and so it's a frame shift and part of it uh, that needs to happen. And part of it might have to do with uh, sort of people's institutions, where they trained, the practice where they trained, um, and as well as sort of whether or not they feel um, uh, comfortable giving. Um, you know, if, if you have a sonographer who doesn't feel comfortable, they weren't trained on this, they might be shy. And if they're in an environment 
where that's not being pushed from uh, the, the physician or re the referring level, then then I think you know it's a setup to say, well, this is not this is not really used, or or in some cases I've heard people say, um, you know, this is a crutch. Um, that you should be able to get images better somehow. And, and in, in general, we know 10 to 20% of people are going to have suboptimal image quality. That is not the fault of the sonographer. That is not the fault of the physician. That is somebody that walks in with, with what they have. And so I think there's a lot more that we can do a, as a society to really change the, 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 the framework of how we think about this. And, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the, the, the questions came up um, in the, in the Q&A here that I see, what is the comment on the relative risks of non-use versus risk yes. associated? I th that's a really excellent question yes. because time and time again, I, I didn't show half the data here, but, but there's... Um, there's data suggesting that use in, for example, in heart failure, initial hospitalization of heart failure may reduce the even length of stay of heart failure and reduce the repeat echo rate. Or um, there is uh, other data suggesting perhaps that it uh, lowers downstream utilization of non-invasive testing or even cardiac catheterization. There are a number of downstream utilization benefits. And so um, getting it in use is is a, both a factor of the people who are giving it, the people who are um, uh, reading the studies, but also arguing to those people who are um, at, the, at the top in the administration of care to say, this is a really valuable technology and here we are, we're not using it. And so um, have them come down to your lab, take, show them actually what a contrast enhanced echo looks like. And show, we, we, we joke around about something called no cardia. We see just about a bunch of fuzz. and. You know, we can take a diagnostic quality, uh, a, a completely non-diagnostic images and make a diagnostic quality echo with, with just a simple intervention. So it, it's just about saying we, we need to use it and, and get it into practice. Well, Jordy, I'm going to, uh, before Wilson comes on here, I'm going to pin you down a little bit. You showed a beautiful graph at your institution uh, and the utilization before you got there. You didn't include... Uh, your mark the 25 percent and 40 percent increase. You are a team doing this, but I think with without a great deal of reflection, why was it so before, and why is it now? Personality driven. Yeah, I think. Driven? I, I think you know there there was just there was not that extra push, um, to in, in many ways and. Um, that contrast may not have been available in, in many circumstances. People wouldn't train. <laughs> and and a, a big, big, big driver of this was was this uh, enabling sonographers to place IVs and also give contrast themselves. Really, the sonographers are the key here. They are they're seeing the patients. They are spending the most amount of time with with each patient and making that decision to give contrast uh, has to be at the forefront of everybody's mind. If you have a, a study that's done and you know, see a clear apical uh, wall motion abnormal, you want to investigate it further, and you don't, in fact, it hasn't been used, that's a missed opportunity. And that's a great time to be able to sit down with sonographers and educate them and to say, listen, this is, this is a great study, but you know, we, we want to we see uh, the diagnostic quality study all within the same setting. And so, so a patient doesn't have to come back for care or doesn't have, it, have to have additional testing. There's so much that we can gain out of uh, the toolkit that we already have. It's just recognition of that and, and also recognition of that, that that's the expectation for people. Thank you, Jordy. Uh, Wilson, your thoughts on underutilization? Yeah. And there's a question uh, directed at you too on, on, I think, question we had on the time between initially seeing an MI patient and starting sonal thrombolysis. But please tell us your okay. thoughts on why it ain't used very much. <laughs> I think you, you touched the point, Steve. Uh, besides all of the points made by Cheryl, and, and Jordan that were great. Uh, I think that one, we know that the most difficult thing to change in, in people is behavior, is culture. And we come from a culture where we don't didn't inject contrast mm -hmm. differently than the radiology. We, we are no, completely non-invasive. And we are changing that culture now. That's what we are doing. And, and this is hard. This is hard. It depends on local cultures. That's why you see so many discrepancies. And I think, I'm sure that in Brazil, it's much, much worse. So uh, I think it, it's culture-driven. And uh, people see it, and they get a cost. They, they see one study, they see that they got a better result. Then they start changing, but this change is, is slow. 
And, and our colleagues, radiologists, they, they started this culture long before. So that's why they, they, they are much ahead of us, but we'll be there. Uh, the, we start some thrombolysis immediately uh, when the patient arrives. He arrives at the elevation MI. We have a setup in the, the ER. Usually today we do it in the ER 10 minutes because the, our door to balloon is very short now. So we do 10 minutes uh, before uh, PCI while they are prepping the patient. We uh, Sometimes the patient even is not per in, the, in a perfect uh, echo position, doesn't matter. We, we focus on the apical views. Then we stop, go to the elevator. Uh, if we have the portable machine, we, we, we do the, the high MI, intermittent high MI in the elevator until the cat lab. Then we stop, they do PCI. After they finish the, the, the primary PCI inside the, the, the cat lab room, sometimes the, the nurses don't like it much, but we keep the patient there and we finish the 50 minute uh, uh, time in the cat lab. We don't wait until they transfer to the, the ICU. Thank, thank you, Wilson. Uh, we've got five minutes more. Uh, Jordi, uh, fire away. And I think you've all seen the questions here. So in your final comments, if you can roll up some of the questions and that will take turns. So let's go Jordi, Sharon, and Wilson will, will allow you to end it all. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment here. Somebody uh, in the, in the, one of the questions asked, how do we uh, raise awareness and how do we become advocates? And I think that's a really, really good point because you have already started down that journey by joining this webinar. Um, it, the, being an advocate starts with being interested and being engaged in the conversation and being part of this. And so um, I, I credit to all of you by, by being here. And I would say, um, join ICUS, join the listserv, um, follow us, follow us along, help contribute to, to, to the cause and, and help contribute locally um, by, by taking some of this education and know-how and, and, and bringing it back to your own institutions. That's really how, how you can best advocate. And, and I think that's a, that's a, a, a telling um, answer. Thank you, Jerry, yeah. Sharon. So, well, to follow on there, what you said, uh, you know, again, I would just emphasize the culture aspect too, as well as education. And I think that we're going to very soon change into a culture where our sonographers, because they have learned as we are introducing this into the curriculum because of the efforts that have been done, they're going to get in practice, say, wait, I'm trained in, in utilizing contrast. Why aren't you using it here? And that's going to drive it. It's just like our younger generation. They know everything. They're going to drive it. So um, I, I think that's what we're going to see in not the, too far uh, future. Uh, quickly, I see there is a very appropriate question here. Uh, thank you for this question about commenting on the recent safety changes for uh, polyethylene glycol in patients and uh, those patients with sickle cell. So um, the PEG issue uh, was brought forward uh, about a year, year and a half, two years ago now, I guess. And um, really, I think what that did is it was post-marketing surveillance that identified the association, it seemed, of utilization of PEG-containing products uh, with um, patients that had severe adverse events. And uh, we do have for in-depth review uh, to answer that question, we do have a symposium or a webinar that we put together and, and uh, Northwest Imaging Forum is the one that has it in their archive bank. And I would refer you to that to review that symposium. But quickly, it just really underscores uh, what we've always been saying. And it perhaps give a, gives a mechanism as to the cause of these uh, anaphylactoid uh, type reactions. And similarly uh, with uh, sickle cell. So uh, there's excellent literature on that too. Uh, Jonathan Lindner, I would urge you to look that up for more detail. In the interest of time, I'm going to give the last words, turn it over as you uh, suggested to Wilson. Thanks, out, Wilson. Sharon. Well, I, I, there's a question regarding you. how do I see it in five years? Uh, I think that one important thing is it's an exponential curve that will flat, we will find a steady state. But one thing is for certain, once people start to use it, there is no way back. They start it, they see the benefit, they will never go back to the, the past situation. So I think I only see growth and uh, I see uh, uh, ultrasound enhancing agents going to the therapy. I think the, the therapy field will be fantastic. We, we will see wonderful, wonderful field things in, in the clinical field, in the areas of acute coronary syndromes, stroke, uh, DVT, uh, I have no doubt about that. We have seen uh, patients with chest pain while insonicating the heart, 
getting pain relief just because of the insulin medication. So uh, I'm quite sure there is a bright future. We need to learn a lot. We, we are in the early phases of learning. So there, there, is, there, are, there is time ahead, but uh, I, I'm, very, I'm sure that we will see it, Steve. Thank you very thank much you for all. inviting me. It was an honor being here. Thank you all. Um, th thank you, Northwest Imaging Forums. Thank you, participants, our faculty.